everybody. Let's turn in our Bibles to Galatians, the book of Galatians chapter number three. We're going to spend this time of preaching, uh, certainly coming from uh, the book of Galatians. It is one of Paul's letters written to the church in Galatia, a church that was and continues to be uh, a, a very fascinating collection of Christians, people who were uh, indeed attempting to figure out how in the in the course of their their lives, how would they live out this gospel most faithfully? Uh, it is intended uh, to be a space where people are really at odds. They, they are trying to figure out, hmm, we've received this gospel, this message of Jesus, but many of us indeed are committed uh, to the Mosaic law, to the ways in which uh, we have to keep the Ten Commandments and all of the 400 plus addendums to the commandments. Men, when they were given the commandments, the Ten Commandments, in order uh, to help provide direction to the children of Israel as to their faithfulness to the Ten Commandments, the scribes and the, 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 the teachers of the law added all these addendums and or uh, descriptions, admonitions. This is how you are faithful to the, the, the commandments by doing this and doing such. And those addendums grew to about 400 uh, addendums to the Ten Commandments, which made a quite legalistic expression of what it meant to follow the law. And so here you have a church in Galatia that is really struggling with this new message of, of freedom in Christ through the power of the Spirit and this kind of uh, wrestling with the fundamentalism of the Ten Commandments and the addendums that uh, followed it. And so here we have uh, Paul attempting to, to speak to them and give them some admonition. I think this may fit us today, uh, given all the things that are happening in our particular culture and society. Uh, so chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, verse number 1, this is what the scripture says, You foolish Galatians! Uh, tell your neighbor, don't be so foolish today. Don't, don't be so foolish. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly, ex uh, was publicly exhibited as crucified. And the only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Having started with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Did you experience so much for nothing? Oh, Paul, Paul not, not showing nobody a whole lot of love today. If it really was for nothing, well then, does God supply you with the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? Whoa, my goodness. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going we gonna to speak from simply the topic, stop lying to me. That's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Stop lying to me. Oh, you ought to put that in your chat. Put that, put, write that down somewhere. Put it on a nice big postcard. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your, your, your workspace. Stop lying to me. God, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you, and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen and amen. Now, there is something very dangerous about deception. Dare I say there's something even more diabolical about self-deception. This is why, you know, Jesus, through the course of his ministry, continued to wrestle with this idea of truth, of speaking truth, of 
naming both the evils, the demons, the forces that come against the work of truth in our lives. Jesus said it like this many times over. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says that we should buy the truth and do not sell it. You may have heard me say things like this many times, that we ought not to be a sellout for falsehoods. We ought not be folks so eager to buy into things that obviously may make sense to the simple minds, but you know how complex your life is. And if simple explanations do not help clarify the complexity of our lives, then why would we attempt to buy into the kinds of falsehoods that are spewed out by those who are attempting to make sense of that which obviously needs much more thick and nuanced descriptions. I mean, it is indeed the case, child of God, that for many of us, we must wrestle against selling out for lies, for falsehoods, at the expense of the truth. And child of God, I hope you know that there are a lot of folk out here who depend on you believing their lies. They depend on you believing the lie about your value, the lie about your worth, the lie about your dignity, the lie about the ceiling that you see and don't see related to your uh, ability to ascend. Believe the lie about whose fault it was that that abuse happened. Believe the lie about your aptitude. Believe the lie about your intellect. Believe the lie about uh, the, the proximity you have to the suffering and to the privilege. Lies, loving to be told. Because if we build our lives on lies, how many of you know the life that Jesus says he represents will often be out of our reach until we reject the falsehoods. And I want you to believe that there are times where we got to just tell folks, stop lying to me. <laughs> stop lying to me. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to receive it. I don't want to digest it or ingest it or internalize, stop lying to me. And you know, there are various levels to this thing when we talk about lies and deception. Uh, I remember when I was uh, taking my drug and alcohol uh, training uh, for my undergraduate degree, and, and, and we, we had a whole uh, series of courses on the way active denial and passive denial works in the human psyche and the world. And it was very fascinating because uh, for many of us, we are socialized to ignore the forms of suffering and challenge that are benign or that we take for granted. That all of the stimuli around us, if we took it all in at one time, it would paralyze us. That we often are taught through the course of our lives to uh, pay attention to certain kinds of evil or, 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 or wrong in the world, but then there are other forms of evil or wrong in the world that we just regard to be outside of our capacity to solve or address. And those things that are outside of our capacity to address, they fall into passive denial. They fall into the background of our consciousness that causes us to leave the world as it is because it's just too much for us to take in all at one time. And, and part of what accepting the world as it is does for us is that it helps us in many respects, 
to not become overwhelmed with information and the weight that the suffering in places outside of our control bring into our daily lives. Passive denial. But how many of you know there are certain things that usually are staring us in the face that we at times continue to deny? And that is called active denial. Realities which require shifting and change in our lives. That if you do not shift these things, if you do not reject these things, they will literally lead to your personal, your communal, and your social demise. Passive denial are the things that you know about happening all over the world, all uh, uh, around you that are outside of your ability to address it. But for your own well-being, you just let that live in a part of your consciousness, and it is a form of, of really uh, uh, survival. But active denial is the, 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 the kind of practice where you literally deny the challenge is staring you in the face. I don't know about you, but I have a problem with active denial. There are times in my life where unhealthy lifestyles, my diet, my exercise, mutual relationships, showing up to work on time, working too much, participating in this and participating in that, and I know through my therapy and through my conversations with accountability partners that these things must change in my life, but at times I deny the impact of these things. And usually if you deny the impact actively of that which requires your attention, it will lead to your demise. Well, this is the context of the Galatian scriptures that we come to. And I think it is the context of many of our lives because we have to begin to ask ourselves, God, what are you requiring of me in this season? Who are you inviting me to attune my ears to so I do not have to be left to the whims of those who get joy out of lying to me. Paul, who wrote this letter to the Galatians, has come to this church that he helped to found, to, to establish, and he asked them, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I want you to know, child of God, that there are a lot of us out here who are bewitched. The scripture, if you look at the Greek of this word, talks about inconsiderate, unintelligent, and unwise. You are prone to slander and bewitched by spells. You are easily deluded. And so the writer Paul is asking the Galatians, who has deluded you? Who has bewitched you? Because many of you saw with your own eyes that Jesus was crucified. Many of you who are now falling into a old practice of legalism of the law, you saw how Jesus and the falling of the, the Holy Spirit on Pentecost literally obliterated much of what you thought was fixed. But now that you've got some distance between the experience of this miracle of Jesus and the experience of the miracle of Pentecost, you are falling back into an old way of thinking and it is causing you to diminish the salvific act of Jesus by appealing to the law, the legalism, and the fundamentalism that often sacrifices liberation. They didn't want people, the Galatians, in their church if they didn't follow their letter to the law legalism. Back in this text, you can find that they're arguing over circumcision. 
Can you be a follower of Jesus? Can you be a part of our church if you are not circumcised like the Jewish laws proclaim? And I believe it's so important, the learning out of this particular passage, for us to be careful to not impose our personal preferences and mistake them for eternal truths. That what you may be personally convicted by does not necessarily equate to the unadulterated truth. That some of these things that our experiences have taught us need to be held with some conviction, but also interrogated with curious discernment by those God has placed in our lives. And what's so fascinating about this passage is Peter, who was with Jesus and who was on the day of Pentecost, preaching the first sermon, showed up in Galatians and found himself being peer pressured into rejecting the liberation message of the gospel that was setting free the cultural expectations of Jewish laws related to circumcision and legalism. I just want you to know that just because you may be an apostle, a bishop, a pastor, a, a hotep, a, 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 a learned person, a PhD, a, a master's degree, sometimes you may find that what you are, are, are promoting needs a little bit more interrogation. And you ought to thank God for the people that are brought into your life to help you get free from the lies that are being promulgated in our culture, in our society. Oh, you ought to just say it again to yourself, stop lying to me, stop lying to me, stop lying to me. Why? Because many of us do not appreciate fully the way in which this era of of, of life has been overwhelmed by lies. And I believe there's none greater than uh, the, 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 the Donald Trump uh, uh, COVID-45 and, and hit the way his leadership has capitalized on mainstreaming fake news and causing so many to have not a healthy suspicion, but an unhealthy uh, obsession with false truths and half uh, for falsehoods and half truths that create chaos. It reminds me of what Jesus said uh, when the prophet, uh, Pharisees and the other haters during his ministry on earth were, were coming against him. Jesus says it like this to them You are from your father, the devil. And you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. That's what Jesus had to, had to set some folks straight. And, you know, you heard me say it before, but I certainly say it again. I, I don't believe Trump is the father of all lies, but I certainly believe he related to that joker. Praise God. Amen. He got to be the uncle of somebody. He got to be a cousin. He got to be, he got to be somebody related to the lies that are being told to deceive those who are in need of the truth. He's the gaslighter in chief and his lips drip with falsehoods and manipulations. And right now he is even having the help of other folk in other countries and contexts who are just as committed to deception, supporting his deception and misinformation. I remember uh, I was uh, at a meeting on Facebook some time ago with uh, some other faith leaders and, 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 and we were being briefed on all kinds of these initiatives and, and it was mentioned to us that uh, in 2016 <clears throat> that there were a number of Facebook profiles that begin to pop up on Facebook that look suspicious and they, they begin to flag these, these pages on Facebook and they begin to realize that there were dozens of profiles being put on Facebook and other forms of social media that were false people, 
posing as real people. They will use different pictures of uh, and racial avatars that will make folks appear to be from a certain background. And they would post uh, false uh, uh, articles and conspiracy theories and they would boost those articles with paid ads. And you wonder why certain articles pop up in your newsfeed all the time. It's because there are people literally studying what we post and what we like and they're feeding us false information. They said that back then there were dozens of profiles that were being put up every single day. And, 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 and the most recent update that they, they mentioned were they are now taking down thousands of false profiles every day. Think about how committed somebody must be to you being lied to. That they're willing to spend their own money to keep you in deception so they can monopolize off of your inability to understand or comprehend more truth. This then leads to my first point for you and I today, that if we are going to endure the lies that are being told, then you and I must first reject deception. That's the first point. Reject Deception. Verse 1 says it plainly, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that for many of us we have been hypnotized by the lies that are being pushed down our throats and overwhelming our senses. That the hypnosis is real. And it's not just the hypnosis around our politics, it's also a hypnosis around your own self-worth and your ability to make it through these challenges or these trials. I saw a, a, a post from a comrade who discussed their childhood abuse and, 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 and talked about how they had been for much of their life taught to shame, to, to live in shame from their abuse. Because the person who was the culprit of their abuse had convinced them that not only was it their fault, but that it would be a burden to others if they ever brought it up. And it was, I believe, a cathartic release to see how the, the liberation of rejecting such a deception opened up a place for healing, not just for this person, but even for many of us who have endured abuse. That there are times where self-deception can be a result of the kinds of wicked diabolical schemes that are being manipulated upon us by people who are more skilled at deception than they are at the truth. And that's why MLK says it so powerfully that there's nothing in the world more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. That you and I have to be people who are willing to reject the deception no matter who is the source of deception. Because re a deception will keep you and I from being able to move forward. And I always believe that beautiful lies are dangerous. And for many of us, we want to believe a beautiful lie than the ugly truth. If you, if you and I will keep it real, I think sometimes that you and, we, you and I, uh, we, we, we want to be lied to. Sometimes we, we'd rather hear what we, what we want to hear, even if what we want to hear is not that which will set us free. Because whew, liberation can be scary when you have gotten used to bondage. Lord, help me in here today. Amen. Uh, for many of us, uh, the lies that we want to hear, even though we know they are not true, can serve to keep some hopes and dreams alive within us. That if we were honest, they had long dissipated some time ago. And when you are holding on to a pipe dream, to something that is not real, to something that can never be, it robs you of the ability to embrace the truth of what could be. Because we continue to hold on to that 
which is always outside of the ability to grasp. Oh, child of God, beautiful lies are dangerous, but ugly and hard truths can be liberating. Beautiful lies, they reinforce false realities for the liar who tells them. But I want you to know, they also create real threats for those who are lied on. And right now, we have all kinds of misinformation that is run amok in our politics and in our culture and in our academies and in our churches. And it is not to suggest that here at The Way, you and I and we carry absolute truth, but we must be able to name that deception is all around us. And we must be people who are able to discern deception when it comes and have the ability to reject it when it begins to demonstrate its falsehoods. I was, I was uh, becoming so frustrated this week about all these many lies being told about uh, voting and, and, and about uh, the reasons why we have a president and a complicit Republican Party and an and a, and a inefficient, meal mouth Democratic Party who can't seem to stop this wickedness on display of an administration who is boldly and publicly trying to dismantle the United States Postal Service so he can have a greater chance to steal an election that is 80-something days away. And I remember, child of God, uh, in 2011, when I was in Kansas City, uh, Kansas, not Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, and I was doing some training about our gun violence prevention work, and there was this this gentleman, his name was Chris Kobach. Uh, nobody really knew who he was. He was the assistant, I think, Secretary of State for the state of Kansas. And we're sitting in a meeting, and he begins to talk about this problem of voter fraud. And many of us were sitting around the room like, wow, this, this, this is, a, this is a, a weird kind of conversation to be having in a black church with a bunch of black folk. And this is a Republican gentleman, a white guy talking to a bunch of black folks about voter fraud. And he began to name all these examples of voter fraud. And I was just so suspicious of it at the time. But, you know, uh, you just kind of think that's not going to, these conspiracy theories aren't going to take root. But do you not know that he was successful in passing laws? about voter fraud and said that we needed to create voter ID laws to ensure that we don't have masses of people voting when they should not be voting. He was saying things that people who were dead were being uh, 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 casting ballots when you looked over the voting rolls. People were voting two and three times and he had this whole narrative that a lot of people refused to interrogate. 2011, sounded real crazy. Well, when he passed that voter fraud bill in 2012, a group called ALEC began to take that same voter ID bill and began to shop it all across the states where African-American voters who were a part of the Obama coalition that helped to, to, to usher a whole different political apparatus into that particular time. They began to pass voter fraud bills that began to disenfranchise the very voters that are already experiencing voter disenfranchisement. And do you not know that Donald Trump, even right now, is attempting to talk about voter fraud through the post office, through the postal service? He's claiming that Iran is going to come and steal your ballots. China is going to come and steal your ballots. Ridiculous kinds of lies. I'm here to tell you, we ought to tell Donald Trump and all these folks, stop lying to me. Because I refuse to believe lies. Oh, I read Justin Levitt. He was a professor of, of, of law at Loyola Law School. And listen to this. He said that out of one billion ballots cast in an election since the year 2000, they've only found 31 credible allegations of voter fraud. One billion ballots cast. 31 credible allegations, which simply means you are more likely to get struck by lightning than we are to experience 
voter fraud. Now, I know for many of us who was here in the Bay Area, amen, last night, amen, we, we saw lightning everywhere. So maybe this point may not be as convincing to you in the short term. But I want you to know, over time, child of God, the lies cannot withstand the light of truth. And this is why you and I have to be people who are not overly committed to the propaganda that is often being fed to us on our timelines and through bad preaching and through the lyrics we hear in the, the industry of music and arts and culture. Some of this stuff you and I need to interrogate. Why? Because a beautiful lie will ruin your life while the ugly truth can help set you and I free. Here's the first question I want you to think about then. What beautiful lies and what ugly truths do you wrestle with in your own life? With yourself, with your relationships, with your politics, and within our world. What are the beautiful lies that you must begin to reckon with? Even though you may like to hear the beautiful lie, you got to say, I refuse to believe that. Or what is the ugly truth? that you must reckon with. You may not want to hear it right now, but this ugly truth can be a catalyst for your liberation. And how can you cultivate discernment along the way? Woo, this thing called discernment, Lord have mercy, is such an important and necessary thing. Why? Because discernment, like sanctification, is a lifelong journey. How many of you know that? That you don't get discernment from the beginning, you get more discernment as you go along. And that's why I like to have lots of sources of wisdom surrounding me. I like to be surrounded by people who are older and people who are my age and people who are younger, people who have more degrees than me, people who have the same degrees as me, people who have less degrees or no degrees than me, people who are incarcerated and people who've never been to jail, people who are gay and people who are straight, people who are trans and people who are gender nonconforming, people who are black and people who are white and people who are Asian and people who are Latino, people who are native to this country and people who are not. It's good to have you a nice kitchen cabinet of folk around you. Why? Because as you go through life, you're going to need to learn some things from other folk that with refinement can help you gather greater discernment. But don't you dare surround yourself with the echo chamber of your own thoughts and the echo chamber of your own anxieties and the echo chamber of your own ideas, no child of God, that does not create discernment. That creates this second point that you must be wary of if you are going to reject the lies being told. You must be wary of fundamentalism. Yeah, put that in the chat. Be wary of fundamentalism. Be wary of it. Be wary of it. Verse 5 says, did you receive the spirit by doing the works of the law? That the spirit is that which brings life. The spirit is that which helps you to have flexibility and to help you to be open to divine surprises. The law, the rigidity of the law, the fundamentalism of the law, that which narrows life into binaries and into black and white and into these kind of polar opposites create a kind of dissonance that keep you and I from being able to respond most faithfully in the world. And there's a challenge that I see right now because it appears to me that we are experiencing among some of our own folk on the movement woke side a kind of fundamentalism and rigidity that is very similar to the kind of rigidity and ideological uh, 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 closed-mindedness that we see at work on the make America great again side. You and I cannot fall into fundamentalism and believe that that is radicality. Radical fundamentalists have no problems taking the lives of those they disagree with. And it, it makes no difference what kind of belief system you have. If it is not committed to love and peace and justice, then your fundamentalism will often lead you to a place where you will be an agent of death and not an agent of life. And like my mentor said, there's a lot of ways to kill a person without taking their life. 
I received a wonderful email from or, or uh, Instagram message from someone who just thanked uh, me for the ways in which our church continues to show up for them because they are in a place that is particularly fundamentalist and they were very much finding life in the kind of ways in which we as a church are wrestling with the complexities of life that even though she finds herself still alive, she was saying that parts of her own imago dei, the image of God, was being erased within her by some of the messages that she was hearing uh, through the priest word or through the doctrine or through the theological positions of her particular tradition. I want you to know, child of God, that our theological positions cannot become so fundamentalist that they begin to take the life of the very once God came to save. Be wary of fundamentalism. Be wary of it. Be wary of a kind of fundamentalism that keeps you and I locked into certain kinds of arguments and positions. When those arguments and positions don't serve you any longer, it's time to bend a little bit. Oh, I love this, this, this proverb, this Japanese proverb. It says it like this, that the bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. I'm going to say that again. The bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. And, and there's a lot of bending that some of us need to be willing to, to endure for the sake of becoming fundamentalists. Uh, I know this election is coming up and we have all our ideals and we have all of our strong positions, uh, but I wish some of us would show a little bit more grace to those who have not been as faithful in their lives as we have not been faithful in our lives. Uh, I don't know if you ever been around somebody that don't think they breath stink. Lord, have mercy. Uh, and they, they just always able to, to point out everybody else's stuff. Uh, but when you come and tell them, you know, you need to take a tic-tac uh, because your stuff is on hum. <laughs> and then they get all defensive and they get all in their feelings and they feel attacked uh, because they don't know that they are not nearly as far along as they may believe. Well, I want you to know, child of God, that fundamentalism will create blind spots in your life that keep you from being able to receive the blessing of correction and wisdom that God sends our way. I want you to believe, child of God, that God does not desire to keep you and I in deception. God wants you to know the truth and to be set free by the truth, not to continue to live in the deception of these fundamentalist ideas that cannot produce life. Uh, for it is the law that produces death, uh, but it is the spirit uh, that produces life. Uh, and you and I ought to be clear about the way that fundamentalism works. Uh, it works first to create a certain kind of criminalization of the other that they don't like. Uh, it works to promote propaganda to make sense of the criminalization and dehumanization of those that others or you may not like. It deploys and employs the violence of the state to make sure that those individuals that you've otherized and you don't like stay in their place. And then it emboldens vigilantes to see themselves as an extension of the state government to keep in place those folk that you don't like. And that's why it's dangerous to be xenophobic. It's dangerous to have anti-immigrant sentiments. It's dangerous to be anti-black, to be homophobic and transphobic, to hate the poor and to hate the marginalized. Because when you are so susceptible to these kinds of fundamentalist moves, then you will find yourself doing the work of the enemy without the enemy even having to show up. I wonder if anybody has ever had those voices in your mind. 
God that keep repeating to you falsehoods uh, even out of the presence of the person that told you the lie in the first place. Uh, I remember when I was in, in school uh, and I used to have uh, some, some, some challenges with the way that I dressed. I was not cool by some. Uh, and, and they used to talk about my shoes because, you know, we shopped the pay less. Uh, and they used to talk about my shirts because in pants they was corduroys. Uh, and they used to just be real mean and nasty. Uh, and I remember sitting in class uh, and one of these folks used to just talk so badly about me. Uh, and I started to say to myself, you know what? I'm going to start recording some positive messages in my mind uh, because I refuse to allow your falsehoods uh, to grab my consciousness and send me into a place of hopelessness. Uh, whenever they started talking, uh, I would hit the play button in my mind. Uh, they would say, oh, look at you, you cornball. Uh, and I would hit the play button of the word of God in my mind. Uh, that would remind me that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, they would tell me about how I looked on the outside. Uh, but I would hit that message in my mind that said that men may look on the outside but God looks at me on the inside I dare you to take some time this week Lord have mercy uh, and to start recording some messages in your mind uh, about what does God have to say about me uh, what does God have to say about us uh, what kind of promises and mandates uh, are we being told to love in God's word uh, if God says that I am a God who loves justice uh, then you cannot be someone who's so wedded to injustice uh, if God is someone who says that he came to set the captive free uh, then you cannot be wedded to systems of captivity uh, if God says that he is the prince of peace uh, he is the light of the world uh, that he is the bridge that he is the door uh, that he is the gate uh, that he is your shepherd uh, then you ought to put all those other messages uh, out of your mind uh, because I refuse to believe a lie when God has given me the truth, uh, somebody shout, ah, don't lie to me. Uh, stop lying to me with these falsehoods. Uh, stop telling me things that don't add up to life. Uh, I believe what God says, uh, that if I keep pushing, uh, I keep striving, uh, that I keep working, uh, keep abounding in the work of the Lord, uh, I believe that my labor uh, will not be in vain. Uh, They'll tell you that you don't have a horizon, that your destiny is fixed. But I'm here to tell you that God has a plan. And God's plan can't be thwarted by the enemy. And that's the last thing I'll say. Child of God, embrace hope and hold on to the possibility of a miracle. Oh, the Bible says that was it not because of the Spirit that you got miracles working in your life? It was not because of the law. It was not because of the fundamental fundamentalist ways uh, but it was an uh, invoking uh, of God's spirit uh, it was the introduction uh, of God's spirit uh, it was the pouring out uh, of the Holy Ghost uh, oh did not the Holy Ghost fall uh, on all flesh uh, did not the Holy Ghost cause uh, sons and daughters to prophesy did not the Holy Ghost cause uh, the lame to walk uh, the blind to see oh God the hungry to be fed it was not the law that brave gave me my liberty it was not the law that made me jump over those obstacles but it was the power of the living God it was not by might it was not by power but it was by the Holy Spirit so child of God tell the devil stop lying to me you telling me what God can't do but I'm telling you what God already did you telling me where I can't go but I'm telling you where God has already brought me he brought me from a mighty low he 
stuck, stepped in. He lifted me up. He placed my feet on a solid rock. He opened my eyes so I can look for a miracle. He opened my eyes so I can expect the impossible. He opened my eyes. Lord have mercy so I can feel the intangible. He opened my eyes so I can see the invisible. That's why I can say the sky, the sky is the limit to what I can have because I believe the truth. I love the truth. I embrace the truth. I will not be hopeless. I will not fall into despair. But I will hold on because victory shall be mine. It shall be yours. It's already yours. Shout hallelujah. Stop lying to me. You ought to tell somebody that this week. Don't argue with them on Facebook. Don't argue with them on social media. Don't argue with them in your house. Just tell them I got a word from the Lord. Stop lying to me. Stop lying. I don't want to hear no more of these lies. Because I believe that there's more going on than these reductionist descriptions of the world. And these reductionist descriptions of my life and experience. Oh, be careful to not allow the forces of sinister, wicked leaders to make you and I believe in the most simplistic of answers when you know in your own life God needed a lot of nuance to get you to the place where you are today. Woo! Lord, have mercy. Do I have any honest folk up in here that can say God needed a lot of nuance? Amen. And I, I, I refuse to fall into the fundamentalism, the, the, the rigid ideologies of both the woke and the sleep. Woo! When God is saying, I need you to be lovers of truth and discern truth. Discern it, discern it, discern it with balance. Discern it through both what you are convicted of, meaning the views you hold, but interrogate, interrogate it with the curiosity of those trusted vessels around you. This is my hope and prayer for all of us. <clears throat> that we reject deception. And we indeed are people who are wary of fundamentalism. But more than anything, we are people, hallelujah, who can embrace hope and possibility. So God, I pray for the people of the way who are listening. I pray, God, that you will help them to know and to see, God, that there is indeed a path to faithfulness and truth. And there are times, God, where the truth may elude us, but faithfulness is all we have before us. So, God, may we be faithful even when truth may not be that accessible because of limitations within us or around us. May we be faithful to you, O oh God, that which we've seen and heard. May we not forsake our own experience, our own formation in your ways, but bring us into a more excellent way. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. God, I want to pray for every person in this place, Lord, who's struggling with deceptions, with the lies that they were told, the pains and the anguish that they wrestle with. It may be a result of their family history. It may be a result of their relationships. It may be a result of their own internalized abuse or internalized racism or internalized phobias. I pray, God, that you will set us free from the shame and 
Lord God, the weight of these kinds of vices so, God, we may heal. For where there is healing, it is always preceded by the truth. God, we want healing, so heal us. Heal our heart, heal our mind, heal our soul, heal our bodies. So we may, God, be people who can indeed walk in the truths of your word as proclaimed to us by the faithful. And we'll say thank you, God, for the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Let the people of the way say amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. I hope this week as we prepare ourselves for this important season of civic engagement and participation. We have 80 days until the election. We have only a couple more weeks to take the census. We need folks to get registered to vote. We need you to request an absentee ballot. We need you to take the census. We need you to reject all forces and deceptions that would try to dissuade you from your duty, our duty, to steward our families and ourselves and our communities through faithful engagement in these systems and mechanisms that are left in our charge to correct. If we do not do our part, we allow the wicked and the diabolical schemes of the powerful to overwhelm the vulnerable. So I'm inviting you, please, register to vote. Request an absentee ballot. Take the census. Do that this week for us. We have a great website that anyone can use. It's called blackchurchrocks.com. Blackchurchrocks.com. And this, this website allows you to check your voter registration. It allows you to check your uh, your ballot situation. It allows you to request an absentee ballot. It's a wonderful online tool that we've partnered with through our campaigns nationally to make sure that through our vote.org relationship, all of us can have an easy way while we are in quarantine to do what we can to show up in the season.